Thank you, Tony, for a very kind introduction. A pleasant afternoon to everyone. I wish to thank uh, ADMU, uh, represented here by Father Jackie Jarin, the Rizal Library, headed by Juan Totanes, the Institute of Maritime and Ocean Affairs, led by Emma Yagardo and uh, Lavi Zomera, and uh, ADMU 198 and Blue 8791 for uh, co-sponsoring this event. And I want to thank everyone present here for attending this event. So uh, this is about the final award of the Arbitral Tribunal, uh, which of course uh, was an uh, overwhelming victory for the Philippines. And I shall also discuss the ramifications. The root cause of the South China Sea dispute is this map. China submitted this to the UN in uh, 2009, and uh, China says, we own everything within the nine dash lines. Basically, that's it. And of course, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia protested. In 2013, China uh, came out with a new map, official map of China, and China added a 10th dash. So the nine dash lines are still growing. Uh, in the new map of China, China said the 10 dash lines are its national boundaries without explaining the basis or without giving the fixed coordinates. Now, that is an official map of China because it was published by Sinomar Press. We had to protest, and so uh, on June 7, 2013, we we sent a note verbal to China saying the Philippines strongly objects to the indication that the nine dash lines are China's national boundaries in the West Philippine Sea and South China Sea. Because what is enclosed by your national boundaries constitutes your national territory. And we cannot allow that, of course. That's the map that China published in 2013. China added a 10th dash here. And if you look at the legend of the map, you see this shading of this line. These are the lines here, the 10 dashes. And this is the same shading you find here in the land boundary of China. So China treats the water here the same way as it treats the land here, its national territory. So very great implications, so we have to protest. Now, under the nine dash lines, China claims the Red Bank, deep within our EEZA, James Shoal, 950 nautical miles from Hainan, 80 kilometers from Bintulo in Sarawak. China claims everything here in the waters of Vietnam. China claims also the high seas. Before you can get, uh, before you can fish here, China says you have to get a permit. This is part of the global commons. These are the high seas. In short, China claims all the resources within the nine dash lines, which includes about 85.7% of the South China Sea including our EEZ, the EEZ of Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Malaysia again, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Now, let, let's go to a few concepts. Assuming this is Palawan, from the low water mark, you measure 12 nautical miles, that's the territorial sea. From the ends of the territorial sea, you measure 188 nautical miles, that's the exclusive economic zone, and at the edge of the exclusive economic zone, you measure an additional 150 nautical miles. That's the extended quantum shock. This is called exclusive economic zone because the exploitation, economic exploitation of the zone, belongs exclusively to the coastal state. And the coastal state is, of course, the Philippines in Palawan. Here, if there is a natural prolongation of the continental shelf, a state can claim up to 150 nautical miles from the edge of the EEZ, but if there's a deep trench here that breaks it, you can claim only up to that deep trench. Here, these are the high seas. All the fish here belong to mankind, part of the global commons. This is the area, this is called the Common Heritage of Mankind. This is administered by the International Seabed Authority, created by UNCLOS. This belongs to mankind, any country that wishes to exploit this as to get a permit from the International Seabed Authority and pay a royalty. And that royalty is 
divided among developing countries. So what is important to remember is that in the South China Sea, the maximum that a state can claim is 350 nautical miles from its coastline. That's the maximum because of the geology and the morphology of the South China Sea. China is actually claiming 950 nautical miles, 600 nautical miles. Now this here, your freedom of navigation for military and civilian vessels and aircraft. So those are the concepts, and then the last concept I will discuss is this. This is a low tide elevation. Because of high tide, it's completely submerged. This is not entitled to a territorial sea. It has no territorial airspace. It's part of the submerged continental shelf. This one is a rock above water at high tide. It's entitled to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea and a territorial airspace. This one is an island. Of course, it's entitled to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. And if it is capable of human habitation of its own, it's entitled to a, a 200 nautical mile EEA. And if there's a natural prolongation of its continental shelf, an additional 150 nautical miles. Very important because of Ituaba. So those are the concepts. In 1995, China sees mischief reef. This is mischief reef. It's a low tide elevation, completely submerged at high tide. China said, we are using this only as a fisherman shelter. That was 1995. We sat down with China and explained to China that the submerged continental shelf it belongs to the Philippines under Amplas. China said, no, we have indisputable sovereignty over that area under the nine dash line. So there's nothing to discuss, we own it. So we talked to China and the same refrain that we have indisputable sovereignty over the waters under the nine dash lines. For 17 years, we kept on talking to China, the same refrain. 2012, China seized Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines. Scarborough Shoal is above water at high tide, about 1.2 meters. So it's a title to a territorial sea. It is a territorial airspace. China said, we own that also. And at that point, we, we ask ourselves, should we keep on talking to China and negotiating? And China will say the same thing. We have to do something different. We did not have the military capability to take Scarborough Shoal back from China, the same way that we did not have the military capability to take back Mr. Fifth in 1995. In fact, our military capability deteriorated from 1995 to 2012. So we decided to bring China to UNCLOS where warships, warplanes, atomic bombs don't count, where the dispute will be resolved only on the basis of the law of the sea, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, where there's a level playing field and where we hope we could win because we knew we had a very strong case. So these are the issues we raised uh, before the Unclass Tribunal. The China's claim to historic rights under the nine gas lines is contrary to Unclass and cannot be the basis of any maritime entitlement, territorial sea, easy, or extended continental No geologic feature in the Spratlys, Rock Island, is capable of human habitation of its own so as to generate a 200 nautical mile easy that can overlap with the EZ of Palawan. The tribunal has jurisdiction to rule on maritime issues because all we're asking is whether a certain rock is uh, as a territorial sea, whether it has an EEZ, and these are maritime issues, these are not territorial issues. Territorial issues involve issues of sovereignty or ownership. What we are saying, regardless of who owns Scarborough Shoal, Scarborough Shoal is only entitled to 12 nautical miles. So we're saying all the issues we're raising are maritime issues because an unclass tribunal has no jurisdiction over sovereignty issues. So we have to carefully craft our claim so that it will not involve a claim of sovereignty. A claim of sovereignty is different from a claim of maritime entitlement, uh, territorial sea or easy. And we also raise, of course, that Scarborough Shore is just a rock. And we have traditional fishing grounds in uh, Scarborough Shore. The China caused severe harm to the marine environment when it dredged the strategies and harvested endangered species, and China committed unlawful acts against the Philippines. 
Now, the first issue, the ruling of the tribunal, the nine dots lines have no legal effect and cannot serve as legal basis to claim any maritime zone under AMLAS. In the words of the tribunal, there was no legal basis for China to claim historic rights to resources in the sea areas falling within the nine dots line. This is the most important issue we raised, the nine dots lines. The nine dots lines are valid, are void under AMLAS. Had we won only this issue, it would have been a major victory already. But we won almost all the rest. Now, the rule, the tribunal said China's maritime zones, just like the maritime zones of the Philippines and other coastal countries, cannot extend beyond the limits prescribed under AMLAS. They cannot extend beyond 350 nautical miles in the South China Sea. Maritime entitlements must be claimed from land because the concept is before you can claim a territorial sea, you must have land. You must measure territorial sea from land. Look at the nine dash lines towards uh, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, that's 950 nautical miles from Hainan. Now, all historic rights in the EEZ, extended colonial shelf and high seas, were extinguished upon the effectivity of UNCLOS. Now, uh, the UNCLOS United Nations Convention of the Sea uh, was negotiated from 1973 to 1992. China actively participated from day one. Now, the big obstacle to the signing of UNCLOS was this, the breadth of the exclusive economic zone. Some countries wanted 50, some wanted 100, 200, 300 nautical miles. The nations with large fishing fleets wanted a narrower exclusive economic zone because in the exclusive economic zone only the coastal state can fish. Since they were, uh, they had large fishing fleets, they wanted larger high seas and the narrower EEZs. Now the Tanla countries wanted also a narrower EEZ because they wanted also to fish in the high seas. So there was this big problem. Finally, there had to be a compromise, and a compromise was struck, 200 nautical miles. Every coastal state will be given 200 nautical miles, but you must waive all other claims beyond your exclusive economic zone. All your historic claims, all other areas in the seas, you waive. You have exclusive. And within your exclusive, all the rest of the world will also waive their claims within your EEZ. That's why it's called exclusive. That was agreed, China agreed, we agreed, China signed, we ratified, everybody ratified, 167 countries are members of AMPAS now. Today, China is saying we are entitled to 350 nautical miles from Hainan under AMPAS, but we have historic claim to the rest of the South China Sea. They cannot do that anymore. You know, the judges in the tribunal, there are five of them, they, they studied the law of the sea, they taught the law of the sea, they wrote textbooks on the law of the sea, they were judges in other tribunals, they practiced before tribunals, so they know this by heart. So we were so sure, very sure, that the nine dust lines would be struck down, and it was in fact struck down. But the tribunal went beyond. We would have been happy here. The tribunal would have stopped here because once it says all historic rights have been extinguished. That would have that would have given us everything already that we wanted legally. But the tribunal went further. There was no evidence that China had historically exercised exclusive control over the waters of the South China Sea or their resources. In other words, the historic claim of China that since 2,000 years ago they owned the South China Sea said that is no evidence of that. We really wanted this because this will debunk the historical narrative of China. I will explain this further later. So we were upheld by the tribunal on the nine dash lines, completely upheld beyond our wildest dreams. So the nine dash lines created this dispute here, this uh, area. This was a dispute. China claimed all of this under the nine dash lines. When the tribunal struck that down, the dispute is gone. The dispute will be created only if the 
island is above water at high tide, so it's entitled to 12 nautical mile, it's capable of human habitation, then 200 nautical mile. So it's all under Uncas now. This historic claim is gone under the, the, the decision of the tribunal. How did we uh, show to the tribunal that China never had an historic claim? We submitted ancient maps. And this is the oldest map of China that uh, I could find. 1136, it says uh, China and the barbarian countries. If it were printed on paper, it would have probably crumbled now or collapsed. But this was engraved in stone. This is a stone map, and it still exists today. You can visit it in the Museum of Stone Steels in Xi'an, China. And it shows Hainan as the southernmost territory of China. Song Dynasty to the Qin Dynasty, throughout the Chinese dynasties, Hainan has always been the southernmost part of China's territory. So we submitted all the maps. Song, Ming, Yuan, Qin, and the last map that I could find of uh, China Dynasty map of China is this map, 1896. The Qing Empire's complete map of all provinces. The last official map of the, of the Qing Dynasty that I could find. And it shows Hainan in insect as the southernmost territory of China. Throughout the Chinese dynasties, Hainan is always in part of Guangdong province. So if you superimpose the dynasty maps of China, China's territory ended here in Hainan. Never reached the Paracels, the Spratlys, or Scarborough Show. This is what we presented to the tribunal. How about our own narrative? Well, <clears throat> the National Geographic uh, published this article in 2014, and says, for centuries, the South China Sea was known by navigators throughout Asia as the Champa Sea, named after a great empire that controlled all of central Vietnam. Where is Champa? It's here. So before it was called South China Sea, it was called the Champa Sea. Why? After the Champs. The Champs had a great kingdom. They were a maritime power. And who were the Champs? The Champs, <coughs> they Boats, their sailboats, have had outriggers, just like the barangays of the Filipinos. And the Champs spoke a Malayo Polynesian language derived from the Austronesian language. Tagalog is also derived from the Malayo Polynesian language that's derived from the Austronesian language. And the Champs, uh, their uh, their artifacts are just as good as the artifacts that you will find in Angkor Wat. And their temples are just the same, but just smaller. But they were the maritime power at the time. They were the masters of the South China Sea. That's why the South China Sea is called the Champa Sea. And when the Portuguese navigators arrived in the 1500s, they knew that the, the South China Sea was called the Champa Sea. So, uh, this is a map that uh, I wasn't able to present to the tribunal because I did not see anything distinguishing about this, uh, important about this map. Until one day when I enlarged it in the computer, I saw that the islands in the South China Sea are called Pulo. Pulo, Pulo. Pulo is a Tagalog word which means island. Now, who made this map? Linskoten. In 1596, that was during the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty ended in 1644. Lin Skoten was the private secretary of the Archbishop of Goa, that's in the subcontinent of India. And so the Portuguese navigators, after going to the South China Sea, would go back to Goa, and he would they would tell Lin Skoten their stories. That's why he was able to make this map. He's an important map maker also. So when the Portuguese navigators arrived in the South China Sea, so these islands, they asked the natives, what's the name of your island? Pulo Kambir, Pulo, Pulo Birkir. They were Austronesians, like Filipinos. We are Austronesians. Austronesia comes from the uh, Latin word uh, Australis, south, and Nessus, the Greek word, southern people, southern islands, people from the southern islands. We are the people from the southern islands. The Austronesians populated 
the islands in the South China Sea, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Borneo, Peninsula, uh, Malaysia, Micronesia, Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, all the way to Madagascar, Hawaii, and Easter Island. Because they had the technology to sail uh, uh, over the Pacific and over the South China Sea. That technology is a boat, the sailboat with an outrigger. That's why the Austronesians were the masters of the South China Sea even before the Chinese reached the shores of uh, the South China Sea. So that is our narrative, and we have the proof for that. Now, we go to the, this very famous map of Father Murillo Velarde, Jesuit priest. Uh, he made this in 1734. This map was printed here in Manila. It was drawn by a Filipino named Nicolas de la engraved by a Filipino named Nicolas de la Cruz Bagay and drawn by Francisco Suarez under the direction, of course, of Father Murillo Velarde. And this map shows Scarborough Shoal with a name, Panapot. Why is it called Panapot? Because if you are the captain of a ship and you don't know where Panapot is, your ship will hit the rocks of Panapot and your ship will run aground or sink. And that is what happened to a British tea clipper ship called Scarborough. It ran aground in Panapot and that's why the European cartographers call this shoal Scarborough Shoal. So for the first time in any month, Scarborough Shoal was given a name, a Tagalog name. And this same map shows Los Bajos de Paragua. Paragua is the old Spanish name of Palawan. Los Bajos is a Spanish term for shoal. So the shoals of Palawan. What are the shoals of Palawan? The Spratlys. So in 1734, Father Murillo Velarde included Manapot, and the Spratlys as part of the Philippines. The Spaniards claimed both Panapot and the Spratlys in this map. This is called the mother of all Philippine maps because from this map, many cartographers copied this. And this one is a very detailed map. If, if you have a, a magnifying glass, you will see all the names of the towns at the time here. So when this appeared in Europe, the European cartographers were amazed. It was so detailed. It's like Google map at the time. So we have the oldest map showing Scarborough Shoal and the Spratlys as part of the Philippines with names. But this is not our oldest map actually showing the Spratlys belong to the Philippines. This is a 1690 map of Father Coronelli, who is Coronelli. He was a, a Franciscan monk. The Franciscans arrived in the Philippines in 1578. And you know, these religious orders would send reports to the Vatican saying what are the new towns, what are the new uh, islands that have been populated or administered. And so Father Coronelli would make maps from these reports. And he drew lines around the Philippines, around the, the Portuguese Indies and the Dutch Indies. And you will see in Palawan, he included the Spratlys as part of Palawan but without a name. The name of this, uh, for this practice was given by Father Muriel Velarde. 1690, very old map, Ming Dynasty, we already have a map showing that the Spratlys belong to the Philippines. You know, unfortunately, uh, our people back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they used the story of Thomas Cloma. But Thomas Cloma is very recent, only in the 70s. 60s and 70s, and maybe 50s or the earliest. We have to go back because China is claiming ownership of the South China Sea since 2,000 years ago. So, and if you look at the exhibit uh, here, there are some maps older than this showing that the Spratlys are part of the Philippines. Now, in 1932, the Chinese started to expand their claims. In 1932, the French occupied the Paracels, it was still uninhabited at the time, and China protested, sent a note verbal to the French, official communication to the French. This is the, the note verbal of the uh, 
the Republic of China under the Kuomintang at that time. And it says, this group of Hainan, the Parasels, lie 145 nautical miles from Hainan and form the southernmost part of Chinese territory. Southernmost part of Chinese territory. Then, ergo, Scarborough Shoal is not part of Chinese territory, the Spratlys are not part of Chinese territory. If you superimpose that on the map, the Spratlys are here. If this is, these are the southernmost part of Chinese territory, the Spratlys were never part of Chinese territory, and Scarborough Shoal was never part of Chinese territory. Their own official declaration to the world in 1932. We presented this, of course, to the tribunal. So let us go to the status of the geologic features in the Spratlys. The red squares here are the features occupied by China, there are seven of them. And this is the ruling of the tribunal. Uh, none of the geologic features, islands or rocks in the Spratlys, is capable of human habitation or economic life of its own, so as to be entitled to a 200 nautical mile PSA. Since there is no EEZA that overlaps in Palawan, the tribunal's jurisdiction. Because in 2006, China made a reservation that it will not be subject to compulsory arbitration in case of overlapping exclusive economic zones. They are allowed to do that. So we have to show that in the spot list, there is no single island that can generate an EEZA. If we were correct, then Palawan has a full 200 nautical mile because there will be no overlap. And we won that argument. Uh, the spot list also cannot be taken as a single unit to determine whether it's capable of human habitation of its own. Now, the tribunal made a standard, a definition of what is an island that's capable of human habitation, and the tribunal said, the island in its objective capacity, in its natural condition, must be capable of sustaining a stable community of people or economic activity that is not dependent on outside resources. Natural condition. You know, in Ituaba, the largest island in this practice is Ituaba, 43 hectares. It's uh, controlled by Taiwan, and Taiwan has put up a desalination plant. Taiwan has imported soil from uh, Taipei, uh, from uh, Taiwan imported soil from Taiwan and put it there in Ituaba, so it, they, they're now growing vegetables, they have trees. So the tribunal said the desalination plant, those imported soil will not count to determine whether the geologic feature is capable of human habitation of its own. So a very strict definition, I will explain that later. So we won that argument. There is no uh, uh, island in the Spratlys that's capable of generating an EEZ. So there is no overlap. We have a full 200 EEZ uh, from Palawan that's not uh, impeded by any other EEZ. So if you look at the, uh, these the Spratlys are here. In the Palasals, there's a big island there, Woody Island, 214 hectares, that would also not qualify as uh, capable of human habitation. The Pratas is a Big island there, 174 hectares, it will not also qualify. Because the tribunal said, if the historical record of a geologic feature shows that there was no human habitation there before, then probably the most logical conclusion would be that the natural conditions are not sufficient to sustain human habitation of its own. And in the Paracels, there was no record of human habitation before until uh, the government of uh, China put their government personnel. Just like in Taiwan, in Ituaba, all the people in Ituaba are government personnel of Taiwan. The Pratas also none. So, in the South China Sea, in my opinion, none of the islands here can generate an EEZ. So this is free from any overlapping EEZ. So the high seas will be the main high seas here. Of course, uh, China is actually a net gainer here. China is the largest fishing fleet in the world with about 230,000 230, uh, fishing fleet. And they go all the way to East Africa to uh, South Africa to fish. And because of this very strict definition, a lot of the islands uh, that, that claim an EEZ can no longer claim an EEZ. So there will be more high seas now 
because islands like uh, the Americans claim an easy for Baker Island in the middle of uh, the Pacific Ocean. It will not qualify anymore because that was never inhabited before. So while China lost here, uh, fishing grounds here, they gained more because they're the high seas. Uh, there are more high seas now because of this strict definition. Geology features. Uh, that's part on reef. China occupies seven reefs in the Spratlys. China built on all seven reefs, created islands on all seven reefs. Quarter on reef, Friday Cross Reef, Cavan Reef, Subi Reef, Mischief Reef, uh, Johnson South Reef, and Makina Reef. This one is very close to Palawan, just about 125 nautical miles. It's between Palawan and uh, it, uh, and uh, Pagasa, our largest island, so this one is a problem for our naval commanders because this will now uh, block our resupply to the islands that we occupy in the Spratlys. Okay, let's go to those islands, to those reefs. The ruling of the tribunal of the seven reefs China occupies in the Spratlys, five are high tide elevations. That means five have territorial sea of 12 nautical miles. Two other reefs, Mischief Reef and Subi Reef, are low tide elevations. They are not entitled to a territorial sea. They form part of the submerged continental shelf of the Philippines. They cannot be owned by any state. Only the Philippines has the right to put up an artificial island or structure there. A union shore is also a low tide elevation. Very important for us because China seized Mission Free in 1995 and has built it now. It's, uh, it is now 590 hectares out of a submerged reef. High tide is totally covered with water now. It's 590 hectares. That's almost as big as San Juan City. San Juan City is 594 hectares. Important, Reef Bank. The tribunal said Reef Bank is entirely submerged. And like low tide elevations, forms part of the Philippine EEZA. It's within our 200 nautical miles. Reef Bank is rich in gas. We had to win this issue. So the tribunal upheld all the issues we raised except for two. Cavan Reef and Makinan Reef, we, we said that, uh, we claimed that they, these are low tide elevations, but the tribunal said no, they are high tide elevations. And these are Makinan Reef and Cavan Reef. Cavan Reef is outside our EEZA, but within our extended continental shelf. Makinan Reef is here. So Makinan Reef remains a disputed area. It's a uh, high tide, above water high tide, and there is a 12 nautical mile territorial sea that remains disputed. Now, let's, let's go to Scarborough Shore. That's Scarborough Shore. China claims it's capable of human habitation. It's entitled to 200 nautical mile territory. Uh, easy. Of course, we said not a single blade of grass grows there. It, you cannot squeeze a single drop of fresh water from those rocks. Obviously, it's not capable of human habitation. And the tribunal upheld us. It's only entitled to 12 nautical mile, uh, and moreover, it is a traditional fishing ground of Filipinos, the territorial sea. And we can fish there just like uh, the Vietnamese and the Chinese. It's a common fishing ground. So we were upheld also by the tribunal. So these are the two slides that will tell you the story of the arbitration. Before the tribunal made its ruling, the red area constitute the disputed area. China claims this red area here, the nine dust lines are here. China encroached on 80% of our exclusive economic zone in the West Philippine Sea. So this was in dispute, the uh, red area. After the ruling, only the small three dots are in dispute. Scarborough Shoal, two nautical miles around it, McLean Reef, and Johnson South Reef, because Johnson South Reef, we already conceded that it's a high tide elevation. China Poseidon controls this, China controls this, and China controls this now. So the entire area, except for the three Dutch, are free from any Chinese claim. That's the result of the arbitration. Now, what's the meaning of that? The, our EEZA in the South China Sea is about 381,000 square kilometers. If you deduct the territorial sea of Johnson South Reef, Makina Reef, and Scarborough Shoal, the Philippines will have a net EEZ of 376,000 square kilometers, free from any Chinese claim. That area 
is larger than the total land area of the Philippines of approximately 300,000 square kilometers. All the living and non-living resources in this huge maritime area, the fish, oil, gas, and other mineral resources, belong exclusively to the Philippines. So we, we legally, the tribunal said, we have this area free from any Chinese claim. Huge area including the Reed Bank. That's what we want. Other rulings of the tribunal, China violated its obligation of Rambas to protect and preserve the marine environment when China dredged and built islands on seven reefs, when China failed to prevent its fishermen from harvesting endangered species like sea turtles, corals, giant clams in the Spratlys and Scarborough Shoal area. The tribunal ruled specifically China caused permanent and irreparable harm to the coral system. This is the first time that the International Tribunal applied the provision on protection and preservation of the marine environment. Very important case. That's mischief brief before the dredging, at the start of the dredging and reclamation. That's mischief brief now. 590 hectares, three kilometer runway, hardened hangars, hardened because they are for military purpose. Here, this area, you have barracks there that could house thousands of Chinese Marines. You have the entry and exit, they have two. The warships will enter here. This is a very deep uh, area. Before the dredging, it was 26 meter deep, so it's deeper now. So it's ideal for warships and submarines, to, uh, for a harbor for warships and submarines. Now, how did China dredge that? That's the largest dredger of uh, in Asia, owned by China. And this one is a rotating steel cutter that is dropped to the bottom of the sea, dropped to the bottom of the sea, and the rotating cutter pulverizes all the corals here. The pulverized corals are sucked into this nos mus nozzle and uh, pushed by pressure here, the ship, pushed through these floating pipes and dumped on the rim of the reef. So all the corals here have been, are dead, they've been pulverized, and the corals here are also dead because they've been piled on, piled over by pulverized coral. That's how China dreads seven reefs. And not only that, because China also dreads 10 other reefs to get filling materials for these seven reefs. China destroyed a total of 17 reefs. Now, that's the marine life in all these corals. They're all dead now in, in, in those uh, reefs of China dredge because there are no more corals. Now, the Tanmen fishing uh, fishermen from Hainan are the harvesters of giant clams. And this is how they harvest. They have a long shaft propeller. The propeller will grind the coral to free, pry, pry free the uh, giant clam because the giant clams become embedded into the corals. That's how they get the corals out. And because of that, the corals become barren. And the Tanmen clam harvesters have destroyed by far more coral reefs than China's dredging to build those artificial islands. That's the uh, judgment of our marine biologists. Those are the clams uh, harvested by the Tanmen fishermen. Oh, they're very rich now, they're multimillionaires because one giant clam intricately carved can sell as much as uh, 100,000 US dollars. They are the they call them the ivory from the sea. You cannot buy ivory of, uh, from the tusks of elephant. Now, they are using this now as the new ivory of the sea. Now, Dr. John McNamus, the renowned marine scientist who studied the Spratlys in the 1990s, went back to the Spratlys last February 2016, and he surveyed the reefs, including the areas dredged by the Tanmen fishermen, and he said, the damage was much worse than I expected it to be. I swam over one whole kilometer of reef before I saw a single living invertebrate. It was really massive, massive destruction. Now, the South China Sea is home to 34% of the world's coral reef, while occupying only 2.5% of the world's total ocean surface. So it's very rich in corals. That's why there's a lot of fish in the South China Sea.
Now, the other rulings of the tribunal, the China violated the exclusive right of the Philippines by interfering in the fishing activities of Filipino fishermen, by interfering with the petroleum activities of Filipino vessels, by uh, failing to prevent Chinese fishermen from fishing within the Philippine EZA, because in the Philippine EZA, fishing is exclusive to Filipinos. Cons by constructing artificial islands, uh, like mischief reef and super reef because they are submerged only the philippines has the right to put up those structures we want all of these issues now in 2010 the philippines awarded the service contract to sterling energy that is now called forum energy to explore and exploit black sc72 service contract 72 that's in the Reed Bank. Reed Bank is fully submerged. The Revenue said it's fully submerged. It belongs to the Philippines. Now, China protested, sending a note verbal to the Philippines on February 22, 2010. That note verbal said uh, China expressed its strong objection and indignation and asserted indisputable sovereignty, sovereign rights, and jurisdiction over the Spratlys and the adjacent waters. China demanded that the Philippines withdraw the service contract immediately. China sent another note verbal on 13 May 2010, again demanding that the Philippines immediately withdraw the decision to award the service contract to Sterling Energy. Now, Black uh, SE72 is just uh, uh, 85 nautical miles from Palawan, and it's about 595 nautical miles from Hainan, very far from Hainan. <coughs> China claims this area, but now the tribunal said no, that belongs to the Philippines. In 2011, the Philippines uh, put up bids, we published internationally, uh, forbidding areas 3 and 4 in the Reed Bank, well within our EEZ. July 4, 2011, China protested, sent a note verbal to the Philippines stating the Chinese government urges the Philippines side to immediately withdraw the bidding offer in areas 3 and 4 refrain from any action that infringes on China's sovereignty and sovereignty. China claims ownership of this area. That's why we have not developed Reed Bank. Every time we send a vessel there, they will be harassed by Chinese Coast Guard vessels. We sent this in 2011 to do surveying in the Reed Bank. They were harassed. Now, Malampaya is here. Malampaya is cut. Part of Malampaya is cut through by the Nine Dash Line. Malampaya is the largest operating gas field in the Philippines. It supplies 40% of the energy requirement of Luzon. It will run out of gas in 10 years. In 10 years, there will be rotating brownouts in the Philippines, in Luzon, if we do not find a replacement. That's why we have agreed to develop the lead bank. We have a window of 10 years. They say it will take <coughs> maybe five years to develop the lead bank. So the window is closing. The ruling now allows us, but of course we, we still uh, uh, have to find out how to send our ships there. But that's it. The Red Bank belongs to the Philippines, despite all these claims by China. Other issues resolved by the tribunal? This is an interesting issue. The tribunal said China violated its obligation not to aggravate the dispute during arbitration when China dredged the rigs, of course when China destroyed the evidence of the natural condition of the geologic features in the space. You know, we, we asked the tribunal to rule that Mischief Reef is a low tide elevation, that Subi Reef is a low tide elevation. But when the proceedings were going on, China dredged and covered it with sand. It's totally above water at high tide now. How did we prove to the tribunal that at high tide, these are submerged? We submitted the nautical chart of China the nautical chart of the US, UK, Japan, Britain, Russia, Vietnam, the Philippines, and all these nautical charts show that Mischief Reef and Subi Reef are low tide elevations. That's why the tribunal said they are low tide elevations. They belong to the Philippines. Now, when a judge or a court tells you, you destroy the evidence, that's the worst charge that a court can hurl at you. And China did it. But China violated its obligation because China would harass our fishing vessels by cutting through the, the, uh, the path of our fishing vessels. Other issues, uh, well, we lost this one, very minor items. 
because we complained that Chinese Coast Guard vessels were harassing uh, the BRP Sierra Madre in Ayun Shoal. Remember that old dilapidated ship that we beached in Ayun Shoal, manned by a uh, dozen Marines? Well, the tribunal said that's a military activity. We cannot, uh, we have no jurisdiction over that. Next steps, enforcement of the ruling. How do we enforce this ruling? It's a sweeping victory for the Philippines. Well, the uncle says the award shall be final and without appeal. It shall be complied with by the parties to the dispute. The parties shall fulfill in good faith their obligations under the convention. And so, inclusion the China, China and the Philippines uh, have the obligation to comply in good faith with the award. We, we have announced we are ready to comply, fully comply with the award in good faith. China said, no, we will not. So what do we do? Now, there are two parts in the ruling. The first part refers to the high seas and the EEZs. You know, when the tribunal struck down the nine dash lines, automatically the high seas in the South China Seas are there. In the center of the South China Sea, there are high seas because there are no more nine dash lines. And around the high seas, you have the exclusive economic zones. Now, under UNCLOS, under international law, there is freedom of navigation on our flight for military vessels and aircraft in the high seas and in the east seas. And the naval powers will enforce that part of the ruling. The other part of the ruling is on our EEZ, our exclusive right to exploit our EEZ, to, to get the fish, oil, gas, and mineral resources. That is our concern. That's not the concern of the naval powers. So what will the naval powers do? Remember, in the high seas, and the easiest, there's freedom of overflight for military aircraft and vessel. That is the concern of the world's naval powers. Because if there is no freedom of navigation and overflight in the easy and high seas, then the expensive warships and warplanes of the world's naval powers will be bottled up in their coastal waters. They will not become what naval powers and world naval powers anymore. So it is in their paramount national interest to assert freedom of navigation on our flight. And the Americans have said, right after the ruling came out, this is what uh, the U.S. said, the U.S. Navy will continue to conduct routine and lawful operations around the world, including in the South China Sea, in order to protect the rights, freedoms, and lawful uses of sea and airspace guaranteed to all. This will not change. The Americans said, we're ready to sail South China Sea, the high seas, and the EZs. The Americans will enforce that part of the ruling. We don't have to do anything. It's not there in our interest because we don't have a navy. We don't have an air force that will be sailing or flying there. Now, the France also said, we will urge our neighbors in EU to patrol the South China Sea. Why? Because France said, France is concerned a loss of this right in the South China Sea might lead to a similar problem <coughs> in the Arctic Ocean or the Mediterranean Sea. <coughs> Why? In the Arctic Ocean, China might, uh, Russia might claim the Arctic Ocean. So they don't want China to claim the South China Sea that will set a precedent because Russia will claim the Arctic Ocean. It is there in their national interest to prevent a coastal country from claiming the sea. You are only entitled to claim your territorial sea. Beyond that, there's freedom of navigation and overflight. That's why when they said that we cannot enforce the ruling, we can. We don't even have to do it. It will be done by the naval powers of the world because it is their national interest. Now, so here, high seas. They will all say it here, the naval powers, including Japan, Australia, and even India, they will fly here, Australia, Australia has been flying in the South China Sea quietly, so that will be enforced, there's enforcement. How about in our EEZ? That's the big problem, and this is where we have to be creative. What if China today brings a gas platform to the Red Bank and start extracting the gas? What can we do? We don't have the military capability to throw them out. So we will, what we will do is we will file a case against China, China National Offshore Company in Canada. In Canada, Sinook has assets, and Canada is a member of UNCLOS, and we will show to the Canadian 
court, the ruling, UNCLOS says the gas in Reed Bank belongs to the Philippines and China National Offshore Oil Company, which is assets in Canada, took our gas. So seize those assets and give it to us in payment for the gas that Sinuk stole from us. That can be done. So there is a legal uh, remedy for us. <coughs> now, the tribunal said China severely harmed the marine environment. We can sue again before an uncle tribunal to quantify the damages. There's already a ruling that China damaged it. It's just a matter of proving the amount. And uh, some of our people have come up with huge amounts. Of course, we will have to prove that to the tribunal. And, and uh, the UNCLUS, the textbook writers call UNCLUS a package deal. Why? Because when you ratify UNCLUS, you accept it as a package. You cannot choose a provision and reject another provision. You take it as one whole. And China has uh, applied for four permits to explore the seabed, the, the uh, the common heritage of mankind. And uh, the International Seabed Authority has granted China four permits. So China is now exploring the seabed. It has the highest permits ever granted, ever granted to a coastal state. The ESA, the International Seabed Authority, has granted only 27 permits for its gun for our country, China. And we will ask the International Seabed Authority to suspend the permit of China because China is not taking UNCLOS is a package deal. It's accepting benefits under seabed provision of UNCLOS and rejecting the dispute settlement provision of UNCLOS. It's cherry picking. So that's another legal measure we can do. And China also has filed an application for an extended continental shelf in the East China Sea that's being processed by the UN uh, Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, another creation of the UNCLOS. We will ask for the suspension of the processing of its application because, again, China wants to benefit from the from the extended continental shelf provision of UNCLOS and reject and does not accept its obligations under the dispute settlement mechanism. That can be done, and of course uh, we can follow Vietnam. Vietnam installed the artillery rocket system bought from Israel. They ins Vietnam installed this in. In their islands, in the spread list, this, this uh, missiles have a range of 150 nautical miles. We and all the air bases and naval bases of China within the spread list are within range of these missiles. So at any time, Vietnam can wipe out all of these air and naval bases of China in the spread list. So if you can do that, if you have the power to wipe out the air and naval bases of China, the Spratis at any time, you control them, they, you, they don't control you. So we can do the same. So uh, those are the measures, so uh, we have to think of more, because uh, we need uh, more uh, creative ways of finding how to enforce uh, the ruling on the EEZ of the Philippines. Now, of course, uh, the decision of the tribunal Resolve only maritime disputes. The territorial disputes have not been resolved because the tribunal has no jurisdiction over sovereignty issues or territorial <coughs> issues as to who owns those islands or rocks that was not resolved. What was resolved was the maritime entitlement. What are the maritime zones of these islands or rocks? Whoever may own these islands or rocks. So now we have to find a win-win solution here because uh, uh, China lost, but we don't want to humiliate China. We want China to cooperate. So the win-win uh, solution is for all Cayman countries to the Spratlys to suspend for 100 years their territorial claims and declare the Spratlys an international marine peace park. Because the Spratlys are the nursery of the South China Sea. The eggs and larvae of the fish that spawn there are carried by carrots all the way to the coast of Hainan, Vietnam, Luzon, Padawan, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And without these eggs and larvae that grow into small fish that are eaten by the larger fish, 
the fish stuck in the South China Sea will collapse. And a lot of people, millions of people will go hungry. So it's in the interest of all the coastal states to, the, to preserve the Spratlys as a nursery of the South China Sea. So is there a precedent to this? Is this a pipe dream? There is a precedent. In 1994, Israel and Jordan signed a peace agreement and they created the Red Sea Marine Peace Park in the Gulf of Aqaba in the Red Sea because they had overlapping claims. They decided, let's just create a marine peace park. We jointly manage it. And it's very successful. So it can be done. And in that case, nobody loses. Everybody wins. We postpone for 100 years the territorial dispute. We freeze it. <coughs> so, in the spread list, the eggs and larvae of the fish that spawn there are carried by currents to the coast of Hainan, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Sulu Sea, Palawan, and the coast of Luzon. Very rich. And, you know, there are marine biologists and ecologists from all over. Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, China, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, they all agree we have to preserve the Spratlys. And there was a meeting uh, between the marine biologists from Taiwan and uh, China, and they had a consensus on both sides of the Taiwan Strait that the region should be set aside as a marine protected area. In the Philippines, our own Marine biologists, headed by uh, uh, Professor Gomez, our national scientist for marine biology, they all say, let's protect the Spratlys as a marine protected area. The Vietnamese also, their marine ecologists are all for it. So what we should do is to encourage these people to petition their governments to declare the Spratlys as a marine protected area. See, the fish in the Spratlys are these fish. And they become the food of the bigger fish, which become the food of the biggest fish, which become the food of people. So if this collapses, if there are no more small fish, then this fish stock will collapse also. So there, it's a food chain. They're all interrelated, and we must preserve the Spratlys as a nursery of this fish. John McManus, Dr. McManus, he was here. Uh, uh, he, he's here now and he's been giving lecture because uh, he's trying to convince uh, governments that uh, we should declare the Spratlys as a marine peace park. Uh, he said, if we don't do this, establish a marine protected area in the Spratlys, we are headed toward a major, major fisheries collapse in a part of the world where that will lead to mass starvation. And the marine biologists all over agree. We have to do this. And I think this is where private individuals can do their part. They can petition their congressmen, their the government, to please declare their, their strategies as a marine peace park. Now, uh, let me go to joint development briefly. China's offered joint development since the 1990s. But no takers, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, we never accepted joint development. Why? If you go to the website of China, you, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you see this. The concept of setting aside dispute and pursuing joint development is the following four elements. The sovereignty of the territories concerned belongs to China. You have to concede. <laughs> now remember, uh, two weeks ago, President uh, Ramos was sent to talk to the Chinese uh, on back channeling negotiations. They talked in, uh, in Hong Kong with uh, Wu Shikun. Wu Shikun is the guru of the Chinese scholars uh, of the law of the sea. He heads the research institute in Hainan. And uh, very cordial discussions, and uh, they talked about joint development, joint fishing, etc. And uh, they issued a statement that they discussed joint development, joint fishing, everybody happy. So they broke off, President Ramos came back. After that meeting, Wu Shikun called a press conference in, in Hong Kong. And he said this, however, before these joint explorations are materialized, 
we should emphasize that the Philippines should first acknowledge Beijing's dominion over the show. <laughs> Goes back to their that's their that's their joint development. In other words, our exclusive economic zone belongs exclusively to China. Your exclusive economic zone belongs to both of us. And if you don't share it with us, you cannot get the gas. Because our warships, Coast Guard vessels will be there. That's exactly the bottom line. I will not discuss that. Now, I would just want to correct some historical misconceptions. You know, China has this narrative. They suffered a century of humiliation from the Western powers, from the Japanese. Well, and the, the culmination of that was the Eight Nation Alliance that occupied and looted Beijing in 1900. Because in 1899, the boxers, there was this boxer rebellion, and the boxers laid siege to the diplomatic compound in Beijing, the, the international diplomatic compound. So the Eight Nation Alliance sent an expeditionary force to Beijing, 50,000 troops, including Japan and Russia, and they defeated the boxers and the Chinese Imperial Army. They occupied Beijing, looted Beijing. And that still rankles in the Chinese mind up to this day. But we were never part of that. Why? In, from 1899 to 1902, we fought a war with the US, where the boxers were fighting the Americans in Beijing in 1900. We were fighting the Americans. We never humiliated China. We never occupied a single square inch of China. We were never the cause of their humiliation. In fact, we were colonized for three and a half centuries, and China always points back to the rape of Nanjing by the Japanese. We also suffered. Manila was the second most devastated city in World War II because of the Japanese occupation. So, they have this uh, narrative we suffered for a century, therefore we are entitled to the South China Sea. non it doesn't matter. But they always do that, and some writers accept it. There's also this misconception. In 1823, uh, the Americans adopted the Monroe Doctrine. All Europeans cannot recolonize South America. We cannot interfere in the domestic affairs the countries in South America, if you have an existing colony, you can continue, but you cannot decolonize or expand territory. That was the model doctrine. The model doctrine, the Americans never claimed the resources of the Caribbean Sea. You cannot apply the model doctrine to the South China Sea because the model doctrine was the U.S. never claimed the resources of the Caribbean Sea. And like the nine dash lines, Chinese claim it everything. In 1823, when the Wanda was adopted, there was no United Nations, no International Court of Justice, no UNCLOS. And in 1823, war was a legitimate means of annexing or acquiring territory. Now that has been uploaded under the UN Charter in 1945. It's a different world. The Earth has rotated 100 million times. So, Robert Kaplan says the Americans dominated the Caribbean in the 1820s, let China dominate the South China Sea, non sequitur. There's no logic at all. And China always says, this is a U.S. containment of China. This pivot, this uh, South China, this will. Philippines is part of the U.S. containment. No. <laughs> the interest of U.S. is freedom of navigation on our flight in the South China Sea. We don't have that interest, we don't have a navy, we don't have an air force. Our interest is to get the fish and the oil and gas. Two different interests. But China says, lumping us together with the U.S. and say, you are part of the U.S. Uh, pivot, and therefore, uh, we will fight. No, we have different interests with the U.S. My final... Uh, uh, topic are uh, China's three warfares. See, China has come to the conclusion that the use of nuclear weapons is self-defeating. And the use of even limited armed force can escalate into a nuclear war, and therefore 
There's no sense in doing that. So China developed what it calls the three warfares to control the South China Sea economically and militarily. Now, the three warfares was approved by the, in 2003 by the Chinese Communist Party, the Central Committee, and the Central Military Commission. This is the body that controls, actually controls the armed forces of China, the Central Military Commission. So they approved this concept, the three warfares, and in this uh, three warfares, the first is a public opinion warfare by repeatedly asserting a historical narrative so that the world will accept it as true even if the narrative has no historical basis. Nine dash line. Legal warfare. Assert a legal basis for the historical claim to justify the claim as an exception to the prevailing legal norms. I'll explain that later. Psychological warfare. Display overwhelming military might, like installation of several air and naval bases in the disputed waters to intimidate the adversary into submission. Let's go to the first warfare. China has this historical narrative. China submitted this to the tribunal. China said, we are not participating in the proceeding, but this is our position. And China said, Chinese activities in the South China Sea date back to our 2,000 years. China was the first country to discover, name, explore, and exploit the resources of the South China Sea Islands, and the first to continuously exercise sovereign powers over them. China has been repeating this historical narrative, and many uh, scholars abroad in the U.S. Have, have bought it, and they've written that, oh, China is an old civilization, therefore they, owned the, they must have owned the South China Sea before. We had to debunk this, and the tribunal said, the tribunal sees no evidence that prior to the convention, China ever established a historic right to the exclusive use of the living and non-living resources of the waters of the South China Sea. So the first warfare, the first thrust of China, we were able to parry that, blunt it, that's dead in the water now. And I hope the scholars all over the world will accept this now. Because they should stop saying that China owned the South China Sea since 2,000 years ago. That's false, totally false. Our ancient maps prove that. The second historical, uh, the second warfare, now China claims that because of the historic right to the South China Sea waters, uh, predates their claim, predates UNCLOS. UNCLOS is only 1982, therefore they are not governed by UNCLOS. In short, they are exempt from UNCLOS. China sent hundreds of scholars abroad to study the law of the sea, masters, PhD, study public, uh, international relations, and they all write about the historic right of China in the South China Sea, just to justify that their historic rights are exempt from UNCLOS. They are not governed by UNCLOS. We had to debunk that. And the tribunal said, all historic rights in the easy were extinguished upon the effectivity of Ambas. Bang. Their thrust has been parried, blunted by the Philippines, it's totally dead in the water. They cannot continue with that warfare anymore. Because all the legal scholars now will have to follow this tribunal ruling. The third, you see, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, thrust of China to claim an exception it was even uh, uh, advocated by Ramos Horta, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. He said, if China cannot accept a UN framework for discussion, let's find another formula, a creative one where everybody would sit around the table and put forth their views. China is a major regional power with historical grievances. Those historical grievances were not caused by the Philippines. We should not suffer for that. And exceptionalism just because it's a great regional power? No. We all signed on plus, we're all the same under international law, every state has the same sovereign uh, power in terms of uh, equality because under international law, states are equal under the law. The moment you start approving of exceptionalism, then we will have hegemony. And the uh, and East Timor now is fighting Australia because Australia said we will not uh, uh, we will not submit to compulsory arbitration under UNCLOS. They're invoking their exception under UNCLOS, but East Timor is saying no, you are subject. So a small state has to rely on international law. 
they cannot allow exceptionalism to a great regional power. They will trample the pan. East Timor is small. There's Indonesia. There's Australia. They have like Singapore. Singapore is very smart. Singapore is supporting us because we're following the rule of law. Because they said if there is no rule of law in the world order, small states like, like us cannot exist. We don't we cannot exist. That's why very important that we follow the rule of law. The third warfare. Now the third warfare, China, China's huge naval bases and air bases and strategies project overwhelming power. This will intimidate other claimant states into submission. China can enforce the nine dash lines as its national boundaries without firing a single shot. That is the objective of China. Win the war without firing a single shot by showing overwhelming force. Fire across reef from a small rock. It's now 274 hectares of air and naval base. Subi reef below water. A sub completely submerged high tide is now 500 hectares. Mischief reef 590 hectares. They have China is mass producing warships at a faster rate than any other country in world history during peacetime. They have assembly lines for warships. They want to show overwhelming force. So how did we how do we address that? When the tribunal said the nine dust lines have no legal basis, and therefore there are high seas and easy seas, and also that their low tide elevation air bases have no territorial sea and territorial airspace. The world naval powers will enforce that. They are sailing, they will fly over Subi Reef and Mischief Reef, they will sail up just beside it, they will assert freedom of navigation on our flight. So that's how we counter that. Our problem really is this, the Philippines, how do we ensure that we, have, we can exercise our exclusive sovereign rights or EEZ? Well, we have to fight this battle ourselves. We have to lead in fighting this battle by convincing, asking the world community to help us convince China, the Chinese people, to follow international law. To convince Uncle's coastal states is in their interest that the Philippines EASA will be preserved because they may be the next coastal state that we trample upon. And uh, we have to marshal the support of our neighbors who are similarly prejudiced by the nine dash lines. You see, all the Chinese today, all their generals, admirals, diplomats, bureaucrats, political members, they grew up being taught from grade one to college that they owned the South China Sea since 2000 years ago. That's ingrained in their DNA. That's why when we sat down with them, after 99, when they see mischief in 99, they just automatically said, no, we own that, there's no dispute. We have to change that mindset. How do you change that mindset? First, we get that ruling from an independent tribunal, authorized under Uncle's to which China is a party. They made that ruling. And the uh, and, uh, Taiwan also, you know, the Nine Dash Lines were invented by the Kuomintang party in 1947, uh, when the Kuomintang still controlled mainland China. They're now in Taiwan. And in 2014, President Ma, the Kuomintang, uh, he belongs to the Kuomintang Party, he was then president of Taiwan. He said, the nine dash lines are a claim to islands only and the territorial sea. We never claim the entire South China Sea. So President Ma aligned the interpretation of Taiwan, of the nine dash lines, in accordance with UNCLOS. Because President Ma studied UNCLOS. He's a lawyer. He to a PhD in law and specialize in law of the sea. He has his PhD from Harvard. He has written articles on the law of the sea. So he completely realigned the China's, Taiwan's interpretation. So there is no divergence of interpretation. PROC mainland China says, we claim everything within the nine dash lines. Taiwan says, we only claim the islands and whatever maritime zones are allowed under international law. So we will tell the Chinese people the correct interpretation is a Kumitan interpretation because they were the ones who invented the Nine Dash Lines in 1947. Plus, there is this tribunal ruling. So, this will take time. That's why I call this an intergenerational struggle. We have laid down the foundation, we have the ruling, the tribunal, so we have to convince the Chinese people because the Chinese government will not comply with the ruling 
unless their own people understand. Because this is a question of legitimacy for them. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you for your patience and guidance.